So we are doing wave mechanics wrap up. And let me uh, remind you of a couple things and a um, couple things we technically covered before your exam too, but we didn't, um, we didn't emphasize it as much as it deserves. So um, let me start out with uh, uh, meaning of wave function. And we did talk about this, but we didn't quite do, I think, I guess I mentioned the phrase probability density, but after that we didn't do anything with it. So um, I was thinking about how to introduce this, and then when I was looking through your book, I realized your book did it the exactly I wanted to do it. So. Um, because what we are going to now say is this. When we look at wave function psi, as I briefly mentioned before exam two, that this psi of this wave function, there is no definite physical meaning we can assign to this. Um, we can calculate probably the density with this, whatever that means. Um, so the place I want to start off from is a kind of a unique example where the wave function actually does have a meaning. Because, um, so for the matter waves that we are going to talk about, what I just said will be correct. Like this doesn't have any physically assignable meaning. So um, but like just leaving it there doesn't give you any intuition and doesn't give you any intuition for what we are going to do next. That's why I want to bring up this example, which I discovered as I was looking at that your textbook does bring up. So what I, want, what we, what I think you should think about is the example of uh, double slit interference of light, where you have light waves coming in and the photons being detected on this screen. I think you saw a version of what they are illustrating here with the simulation some time ago, right? So uh, this is what you see with the high intensity light. When there's enough intensity, then you see this smoother thing. When you reduce the intensity so much that you detect one photon at a time, this is what you are starting with. And as you accumulate more number of particles, eventually this pattern emerges um, again. That's what you saw with the simulation. Now this is what I want to point out with, uh, the, with the example of light wave. So what is waving? What is oscillating in light? Like, you know, this uh, wave front, it represents something. This wave front, it represents something. What does it represent? Like what physical quantity does it represent? Yeah. So electromagnetic wave, which if you describe it in English, is oscillating electric field and magnetic field that's coupled in a particular way. If electric field oscillates up and down, magnetic field oscillates sideways, they are coupled in a way that they propagate in a direction. So what you, you can say what is, you, you can actually say what's oscillating here. You can say it is the electric field expressed as a function of position and time. So the, um, in this particular example, you could call this the wave function. This is my wave function. But in this uh, special example, the wave function actually has physical meaning. It's the electric field. Now, what you see on the screen, what you see here, does this represent actually the electric field or does it represent something that's uh, related to the electric field but not quite the electric field? Like what does, is there one word that describes what you see on the screen? Intensity. intensity. What they are plotting here is intensity. Um, so this is where intensity is zero, and these are the locations where intensity is a maximum. Is the intensity ever negative? 
Why is it not negative? I know electric field oscillates from positive to negative. It's a square, right? You guys remember from what we did in optics that this, uh, you know, this intensity function, intensity, well, it's a, yeah, intensity function, it's a proportional to the electric field squared. Or if we want to be a little bit pedantic, absolute value of electric field squared. This absolute value is especially useful if you took to this uh, representation of electric field that I was trying to get you to without really, I mean, you didn't really need to back then, but you could have used this complex representation of electric field. E naught times E to the I kx minus omega t. If you, so for plane waves, if you use the, this as your representation of electric field, if you simply took the electric field and squared that, if you simply took this and squared that, that wouldn't really do because what squaring this does is, that, well, okay, so you square the amplitude and for this complex exponential, you just uh, multi you know, raise to power of two. And uh, so you still have complex exponential. You don't want that. You, you want a time averaged uh, quantity. So, the mathematical procedure for doing that um, is, so this is the wrong um, answer to get. So the mathematical procedure for doing that is the absolute value squared or keeping the complex quantity in mind. This is the complex conjugate times the, the, the original function. That's what absolute squared means in the context of complex numbers and functions. That, that was actually your last multiple choice exam question. <laughs> um, if you knew that, like if you had to remember that, then um, it came out pretty simple because this multiplied with its complex conjugate just gives you one. The, the i in the exponent cancels out with the minus i in the exponent that you're multiplying with. Yeah. Okay, so this is where I want you to develop the intuition that the intensity which describes what you are measuring on the screen is given by absolute square of the electric field. And we are going to take this model to this matter waves also. So we are going to say, um, so, um, so, so what's changing with the matter waves is that if we are trying to assign a meaning to this, then there isn't really a meaning. Um, it's, uh, I mean, so, you know, think of this example here. Example of an infinite square well with a single electron inside it. And somehow the states of this electron are represented with these different wave functions that you have seen before. The ground state wave function, the next excited state wave function, and the one above that, and so on. Somehow the state of this electron is represented with this, but if someone asks you the question, what is doing the oscillating? There's nothing you know physically that would correspond to that. Like, what is, um, I mean, it, it, there's no collection of particles you can say is whooshing back and forth. It's not like a sound wave like that. It's not electric fields. So, you know, there's no meaning you can assign to this. But you can assign a meaning to the absolute value squared of the wave function. And what that is like is it's almost like intensity but we have to refine this notion a little bit because the reference to this says intensity made sense in the context of double slit interference experiment with photons. It might even make sense if you are doing this experiment with electrons, then nothing really changes. Um, like intensity of light is directly proportional to the number of photons you are counting so you could have said intensity of electrons is the number of electrons you would be counting, right? You could have said that. Um, 
But when you now think to this example, um, it, it, the referring it to as intensity kind of breaks down. Because you are always going to measure one electron. Like, so number of electrons you are counting, that's not exactly right. And this is where I want you to start thinking probabilistically. As in, um, as in, when you look at this plot of intensity, then, so this is where um, it's going to get more ab abstract. So this is the kind of plot of intensity, right? Yes. And when you look at this, I don't want you to think about actual photons being detected. Because if you are looking at actual photons being detected, and you're, we are going back to this, counting tens of thousands, millions of photons, and eventually building up an actual pattern. But I want you to think of this as giving you the likelihood of finding a single photon at a particular place. So as an example, what is the likelihood that you would find the, uh, I guess I should use a cursor, it's more stationary. All right. What is the likelihood that you would find a single photon, um, that, that a single photon would be discovered at a location where the cursor is at? What is the likelihood of that happening? Pretty low, like zero, right? All right, um, and that applies to all these other darker fringes as well, right? You would uh, never find a photon there, or you know, kind of never. <laughs> so then let me ask you this question. If you had a single photon going through, what is the likelihood of finding it at this location? Pretty high, now would you say 100%? No, why not? Yeah, other points. It could have fall here, it could have fall here, it could have fall anywhere along this vertical line. So now this does um, this does represent one of the places where the photon has highest likelihood of falling on it. Now let me slightly rephrase my question. If you had a single photon go through the double slit, what is the likelihood that it would have fall somewhere? within this entire pattern? 100%? Yeah. So what we are describing here is what we are going to call probability density. So let me uh, give you a graphical representation of probability density. So this is probability density. I'm going to use capital P as a function of x. And let me just say um, this is my x equals 0. So the probability density, it looks like this. And for some reason, it's zero here. Uh, let me do it in different color. And at some point, it comes up, down, one, two, three, four, five. Up, down, up, down, up, down. Wait. And you have a maximum value here. Um, it, let me just call it P max. Now, what I can tell you is that this is not going to be equal to 1. Yeah? For 1, it's in the wrong units. Uh, we'll talk about units in a little bit. Um, what is equal to 1 in this case from our discussion? Area under the curve should be equal to one, right? So if you, you know, I'm going to just shade that area. So if you have that area and calculate it, so that area should be equal to one. Now, mathematically, how would you represent that? Yeah, you do it with integral. All right, so you are, so this is your curve, not wave function, just a curve. Um, and you integrate this curve as a function of x. Put away your phone also. As a function of x, um, so 
what you are integrating is this curve with respect to x and over all space. Let me just say all space for now. And what that usually means is from x approaching negative infinity to x approaching plus infinity. Um, everyone agree that that's the correct integral to do? So this uh, um, kind of tells you though what unit this probability density should be. Everyone here is clear on what unit of one is, right? To unit less, that's why it's one, no unit. What is the unit of dx? It's length, right? So this says unit of meters or length. What is the, so what must the unit of this be so that this comes out right? Yeah, it should be one over a meter so that the units cancel out. Because the, in the integration, the important part is this integrand. The, the rest of the procedure, you're just adding up the terms together. That doesn't do anything to the units. So when you look at the integrand, that tells you, uh, looking at what your variable of integration is, that tells you what this is. So this probability density, it should have unit of, um, meter to the minus one. So this maximum could be, I don't know, it could be at a value of 0 0.2 inverse meter. Like that's a possibility. But it wouldn't be at 0. Point, uh, it wouldn't be at one meter or one. It would have this, it needs to have this correct unit. Yeah? So that's a probability density. And in fact, so this is what we have been ignoring so far before exam two, because I didn't want to model, um, well, I didn't want you to have to worry about this for exam two. Um, we are now going to start imposing this requirement. This is called normalization requirement. Normalization meaning that, um, um, that when you take the probability density integrated over all space, uh, in this class, we are only going to do one-dimensional example. Then that, that result should give you a one. 